So how you been, man? How's everything? Good. <laughs> Busy. Uh, good, though. Yeah, lots of work to do still. So how about you? I, yeah, I would say the same. Not quite. I would say as busy as you, but uh, very interested in seeing the uh, more development and excitement within the space, especially since the launch of, well, the announcement in the, of the so-called launch of Facebook Libra, which kind of prompted this uh, talk for us. Um, let me ask you this. What's your take on that? Um, well, I think there's like, there's a number of interesting like perspectives coming out still. I think people are kind of looking at it. Uh, some people are, are responding to it saying, well, this is like, you know, Facebook traditionally uh, extracts value and it's going to continue to use this to extract value. Um, and then there's also people talking about like the governance structure and the bodies in the governance structure, um, obviously, obviously having an economic incentive to do so. I think like for me, uh, you know, the thing that I always kind of look at is, so they introduced Libra. Um, it's a stable coin. It's fiat back across a number of uh, currencies. Um, in that opportunity, I think the single greatest opportunity in my mind is to uh, not just have a stable coin that is kind of borderless or, uh, you know, borderless, but more is like, to rethink the way we structure the internet and the value distribution systems of the internet. Um, and like to quantify that, I think last year, the statistic in 2018, Facebook generated $55 billion um, in advertising revenue. I think Google did 46 billion. Um, but I think the question is, is like, why do we, if so, like software is becoming ubiquitous, like everything has chat functions, everything has video, you know, ephemeral video messaging. It's not that hard to do this stuff anymore. And so to rebuild these types of infrastructures. So then the question becomes is like, why don't we build a system that benefits everyone rather than just benefiting one person or a company? Um, like how do we build an internet co-op uh, so that all network participants uh, based on their proportional usage uh, benefit fr from the economic value of the network? Which then leads me into kind of like the topic that I want to talk about is can you uh, go into and explain the whole process of how Buns started and what you guys are doing and uh, where you guys are currently and uh, what's kind of the futuristic roadmap with Buns? Sure, yeah. Uh, so Buns started as a Facebook group. Um, it was really simple. It was Emily Bits. She founded the Facebook group, uh, the first one. Um, it was a number of other, them, other groups were founded by other people um, who believed in similar things, but it was a bartering economy. Uh, so people could just like post stuff that they weren't using anymore and other people would be able to make them an offer for it. Um, and we launched the Buns app, I think in 2016. Uh, and that was our first, like we almost look at like Facebook because we came from Facebook. So we almost look at it like we wanted an alternative where we could build a sustainable community and have that community benefit from its existence rather than Facebook. And like to demonstrate this, uh, to, like, to kind of, you know, make, clear what I mean by that is like Facebook, uh, if you run a Facebook group with like hundreds of thousands of people in it, you actually have no mechanism by which you can monetize that group. Uh, and what that means is like the people who are actually doing the work to maintain and create quality of that group are actually not being compensated for it because Facebook, that's Facebook's business to advertise to that group, not there. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to create a, a kind of a home where that could be sustainable. Uh, we thought that, you know, we often joke like we are a fork of our own community from Facebook. Um, but I think we looked at it saying like, hey, how do we win at something, you know, head toe-to-toe -to -toe as a really small company? How do we beat Facebook at something? And we said, let's do them at bartering. Um, so in 2018, we built uh, the bartering application up to the point where it had a billion transactions, a million transactions a year, not a billion, excuse me. Um, and then uh, we started to explore uh, the need for a currency. Um, and a medium of exchange because the as we approached a million transactions completed in the bartering economy, the classical economics issues associated with bartering, like medium of exchange, value disparity, divisibility of goods, starts to present themselves. So we started to level off the transaction velocity, and we needed a, a, our own medium of exchange to be able to create um, kind of that to relieve the bottleneck. Uh, so when we looked at it, though, we said like, okay, well, we could use dollars or fiat. Um, and a lot of people to transact just like any other classic marketplace, but that's, you know, that's been done. Um, so really like what would happen if we really did kind of take on some of the decentralization ethos around 
um, you know, the distribution of value derived from the network being paid to people, particularly from data and attention, and then use that as the medium of exchange in the, in the network. So, you know, by using this application, you passively earn this value and then you can use it with each other in the network. Um, so that's kind of how we ended up where we are at a really high level. And so how does Buns work right now? Um, so, yeah, so there's a, the application centralized, um, it just kind of works better that way. I think the throughput probably bottleneck at most any public chain right now. Um, uh, like in the last 13 months, people did 4.7 million transactions in bits. Um, there are some coffee shops that are doing like 30% of their monthly transactions now on the currency. Um, so it's, it's been, you know, quite, quite a quick growth from like I, the prior year doing 1 million transactions to 4.7. Um, so the application, uh, the currency is centralized on the application today. Um, but we have a bridge where you're able to send uh, bits from the application to Ethereum mainnet. So if you want to hold the ERC, ERC-223, you can. Um, bits we never sold to anybody. We never did a token sale. Uh, we wanted to create a currency whereby people, again, could earn the value derived from the network rather than having to pay. Because I think like the two big technologically prohibitive, there's two big prohibitive factors to uh, adoption of cryptocurrencies as we understand them. And I'm extracting, uh, I'm using like a very abstracted definition of the term cryptocurrency, probably like Libra would define it. Um, and I think the two big prohibitive factors are technical barrier to participation, meaning like the technical knowledge required to be able to participate in this space is quite high. Um, and I think secondly is no one really talks about this is you have to buy it. Uh, like it costs money to get currency um, rather than uh, rather than having the opportunity to earn value on the future value of the network's throughput. Um, so I think those are the two big barriers and we wanted to reduce those so that we could create what we describe as probably the most usable currency. Um, and I, I mean, right now, right now there's over 375,000 users on the Buns app. Um, and, you know, I think there's over 110,000 active wallets now. Um, so it's grown quite a bit. And is Buns, uh, you guys control for stability? So it's, it's dollar for dollar? Yeah, so it's, it's actually not, not it's not dollar for dollar. It's more like penny. Um, so okay. uh, essentially the way it works is like a business who wants to reach, like, let's say a business wants to reach Facebook. This is the best like analogy. If you imagine buns, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a Facebook, you know, uh, works with advertisers, hundred percent of the value that they, they sell to advertisers who want to get in front of their, their users or their customer base. Um, Facebook keeps that as profit. That's the social contract. Uh, the social contract is you get to use Facebook for free and Facebook gets to monetize your data and information and attention. Um, with buns, it's a bit different. A brand wants to interact with a, you know, a person on the application. Uh, and, uh, when they do that, let's say they spend $10,000 to advertise $6,000 gets turned into 600, 600,000 bits, which gets circulated to the community. Uh, and once it's expired, that 600,000 bits has been earned based on the number of impressions or CPM rates. Uh, then that currency is now in full, full, full circulation. And then that person has the ability to spend it peer to peer and or walk into a retail location and spend it on coffee or go to, you know, IQ foods or um, other locations. There's like, I think there's like a hundred over 155 different locations in Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, Hamilton, Montreal, and San Francisco now. And so, so if I go on the Buns app right now for people who don't know, and I want to, for example, do bartering, let's say I got like brand new, really good Sharpie markers, right? They go for like, I don't know, $15. Um, do I, does it automatically then put like the buns amount? So if I say this is $15 Canadian, how does that process work? So like, you know, the interesting thing about how the currency value came to be is it was the weirdest thing. And it sounds kind of silly, but a lot of the stories are quite organic here. Um, like we never were like, okay, we're going to set it to one bit is equal to one cent. Uh, what happened was like, we, you know, we created the ERC 223 contract. You can look it up on Etherscan. And we're like, okay, let's go talk to a business who would want to accept this and explain to them what we're doing and then have them upload an item and set a price to it. And the first uh, shop was a coffee shop and they uploaded an item that was uh, a cup of coffee for, it was, they typically charge $3.25 for it. So it was three twenty five dollars is what they put in without any decimals. And then as we started to talk to other businesses, they used that cup of coffee as a reference point. And so they mm. were using that same value. And then the community started adopting that value based on the redemption rates. So, um, but yeah, like when you post that item, you go to the Buns app, um, you post your marker, you say how many bits you want for it. Um, and uh, people can make you offers for it. Um, they can directly message you and negotiate uh, and they can send you bits both uh, through the chat 
or in real in real time or in real or in real in real life when they meet up with you. Um, and some people will even pay you for like delivering things to closer to where they are, right? But is it within the app that let's say it's like a thousand bits? Does it give you the equivalent of a Canadian value? Of- no, no, okay. it's not. Like it's, we never listed it on an exchange. Um, I mean, obviously, you could take you can transfer your bits through the bridge to Ethereum mainnet and hold them as the ERC two two three. And if you wanted to, you could sell them on a Dex or something. But we don't have any formal exchange support, um, just because that really hasn't been our focus. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like sub 1% of the total supply of bits is in circulation. So it's like, it's still really early uh, and we're not in a rush to, to have it uh, listed on an exchange. And what's your guys, what's your guys like issuance rates? Are you guys trying to figure out like how much, do you guys have a, a formula or a system you've created for how many bits are you will be creating? Yeah, there's the, the, the well, that, that contract is governed uh, already. Uh, it's already published. You can look at it on ether scan. There's scan. There's 200 billion bits. Uh, as a fixed supply, um, but uh, when a business essentially when a business buys uh, advertising or wants to reach our community, sixty uh, percent of the value that they spend goes directly to our users and bits. Mm. And so, let's say I'm a coffee shop somewhere in Toronto, and yeah. I'm accepting bits. What do I then, as a coffee shop, do with the bits? So there's a couple things. Um, so you can use the bits to. So okay, you you know you have a let's say you've done a bunch of surveys and you've seen some ads and you've sold some stuff and you've got a bunch of bits. Now you can walk into a coffee shop and let's say you spend the same classic amount of 325 bits and you buy a cup of coffee. Uh, the business has the ability to redeem with us the bits, um, but they also have the ability to do other things with the bits. Like they can use the bits to turn on modules that will help them generate more value from the community. They can use the bits to reach more people to come into their shop and spend more bits at their location. Uh, but they do have redemption, like a like a contract that allows them to rede- redeem against treasury with us. And so, so if like they want to reach more, in the last thirteen months, people have earned and spent uh, over one point three million dollars. Wow! Yeah, impressive. And so if I'm a business and I want to then target and acquire more users geographically, obviously since I'm a coffee shop, and let's say I don't know, like this month, somebody you know, total five thousand dollars worth of bits people have spent on my coffee shop. Yeah. Uh, How does that process work if I want to get more users from the bit platform into my coffee shop? Yeah. So uh, these are things that we're working on, right? So um, there's, we designed about 40 different modules that are specific to both brands and retail locations. So like bigger and smaller, some of them are chains, some of them are not, but like the classic example of something we're working on is, and we took the first step to doing this by building a merchant app. So uh, we piloted a merchant app uh, where the, the retailers could use uh, the app to maintain uh, or like quick, quickly check out customers rather than just having a static QR code with an open wallet. Um, and so uh, that merchant app allow, will allow them in the future, in the near term, will allow them to do things like if you're a coffee shop, maybe you want to turn on a geofence uh, around your coffee shop and uh, anyone who hasn't purchased a coffee from your location on Buns uh, can be offered a coffee or target that person with advertising, letting them know that, hey, you know, you passed by my shop today. I accept bits, actually, and mm. you can buy coffee there. Um, so what it allows them to do is to build more community around their local business. And, like, one of the important things, I think, when we see about these stable coins, and I actually like, think this is a hugely missed conversation piece, is that it, the thing you don't want to do, if you're going to take a whole bunch of value that would typically go to a company like Facebook and you're going to redistribute it, what you don't want to do is have that money go back into centralized organizations. What you want to do is to have it circulated at a geographic level where, where, the, where the application is proportionally used. That way we create more resilient localized economies rather than uh, having the, the, the value redistributed where it classically would have been centralized and then all of a sudden re-centralized because it all goes to Amazon. Um, so I think there's key things and nuances here that although it's a, a, you know, attractive to just kind of put it into Uber – um, uh, you know, as an example, like partner with Uber and have them accept it or something. I think that's attractive as an idea because people use Uber a lot. But I think really what we need is to, to have software systems that benefit localized economies um, where they're earned and used. Yeah, it's also the buying power too, right? Like you look at the stable coin or even like the U.S. dollar. What's the buying power of U.S. dollar in Toronto versus the buying power of a U.S. dollar in Bangladesh? Etc. Right? There's yeah. different scales of economy over there. Um, I have another question. 
Sure. Uh, since you said it's not correlated to the Canadian price, how how does one like say uh, say I'm a neophyte, a newbie, and I'm logging in? I'm like I do have a bunch of stuff I want to sell or barter, etc. Uh, specifically sell. Um, since I don't know, I'm not in, inundated in the community. I'm not you know I'm not familiar with how the bits derive value. Um, how do I know then what to set my item as for the amount of bits? I think a lot of people look to each other to get a frame of reference. Um, there are blog posts and stuff that we kind of explain what we're doing. Um, so, and we, we try and ensure that those are circulated with the advertisements in the application. So people are educated. Um, but we don't put like an explicit value because we don't really know. Like this is kind of one mm. of the things where, uh, you know, at the time, like a year and a half ago when we started a year and a year and a bit ago, when we started doing this, you know, a lot of people were like, hey, like, you know, listen on an exchange, have an ex like explicit rate uh, so that people know. But I think really people look at each other's posts and are like, hey, that person's kind of charging about this, about this for it. Or if I go and spend it at this retail location, I can kind of get this out of it. Um, so there isn't really an explicit rate when you're posting an item that we would quote. Um, and I think that's so it's the purest form of like laser fair capitalism. We don't know. We don't know. Like, I yeah. think that. And like, I think we, we were stabilizing the redemption rate. Like that's what we're mm. on doing now, but it doesn't mean that that's the true rate. I think, I think like it's, it's naive to believe that we've, you know, we know that. Um, and I think it's, it's a bit of a social experiment in that regard. Um, but I, I think pretty quick, quickly people understand what the value is based on like what the merchants are taking the currency at. And then they're either, um, you know, charging more or charging less, depending on that. One of the really interesting things also is like how people, like this is one of the recent observations. We have like a team of researchers we work with at MIT and like we started looking at gift cards and whether or not people would accept, uh, take more bits or less bits than the value of the, value of the gift card. Um, because the bit, bits would have, because of the number of retail locations that it's accepted at, has a, per, a perceived greater value than a card that is isolated to one specific company. And so it's just super interesting to see what's happening and allowing people to kind of make their own decisions rather than prescribing, um, you know, the rules of, to the logic. Um, yeah. Have you noticed, uh, so let's say I do finish a transaction and I earn a bunch of bits. Have you noticed the ratio of how many people reuse these bits versus how many people want to cash out for, let's say, redemption of fiat or whatever they want? Yeah, we, we closely monitor. Um, so I think like the vast majority of the value is being held onto by users and used peer to peer. Um, so I think there's like typically two things. I think like when you first use the application and you earn some bits and then you go buy a cup of coffee for the first time, you're like, I think the realization people have is like, oh, wait a minute, like I can actually use these. Um, mm -hmm. and I think, I think, I think then like the next piece is like, can we rewind when people like, when you say like earn the bits, is there more than just one way of earning bits? So I can go there, sell this, I earn a bit. Is there other ways for me to earn bits? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, every day there's something called the daily airdrop where you can a answer questions and typically they're sponsored by businesses. Um, like we've done work with like Lyft, uh, Wealth Simple, Coho, uh, Borowell, Open Care. Uh, there's tons of amazing Metro. Uh, tons of amazing partners have literally looked at this and said, hey, this is an alternative to traditional advertising whereby the community is benefiting. Like, we want to get behind this. Um, so we've made it possible for businesses to participate in this space in a meaningful way. Um, but so uh, the airdrop, the typically the, every day there's a question asked. It's a multiple choice question. When you answer, you get to see how everyone else in the community responded. There's, you know, a huge number of people that do that every day. Um, that data is like targeting data. Um, that, you know, brands can use to be able to respond to, to your response itself. So let's say the question is like, hey, which one of these suite of Microsoft tools do you use most frequently? And you say Office and I say Excel. Maybe tomorrow we'll see an advertisement for a Surface Pro, but you see Office and I see Excel on the computer. Like, so contextualizing things um, based on our, our preferences. Uh, so there's the daily airdrop. There's the traditional feed ads. So there are ads as you scroll through the application and as you see them, again, attention economics dictates that that value is yours. So you get paid for those. Um, when you activate your wallet, when you, or you invite someone to the network, um, you get bits. Uh, when you, um, what else? Uh, if you have something that becomes really popular, uh, there's a small bonus for that too. So really like it's data, attention, and contribution to the network um, are the three key pillars um, that make a network valuable. And those are the three key pillars that pay out bits in, in, in response to interacting with them. So currently right now is just 
uh, just for products, right? So I have a physical product product I can sell. Are you guys planning in the roadmap? To all- people post services. People post. Ah, okay. People post apartments. Um, it's like there's a lot of. So it's pretty much a classified. You can post whatever you want. You can post whatever you want. Yeah, I think the idea here is is like. Um, it's just like, it's a marketplace. Um, but what we're about to launch is going to be really interesting. Uh, next, uh, in the next three weeks, we have a beta right now happening for, uh, actually social communities. Um, and what we're doing is like, you know, if you run like a Facebook group or you run like a, you know, one of these social communities, you actually, again, you have no mechanism by which you can monetize your work. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, as your community grows and a business wants to engage with your community, let's say you, you happen to run like, uh, car spotting group and I run a food, Toronto foodie group. Uh, maybe Nissan wants to reach your customer base and they can show advertisements for Nissan cars to your community. Uh, so 60% of that money would go to your community of, of that 60%, maybe 10 to 10 to 20% would go to you as the administrator. So all of a sudden, if they spend $10,000, you're taking home 2000 of it that month. Um, mm-hmm. and your community gets $4,000 of it in bits. And let's say I run the foodie group and maybe Loblaws wants to reach that community by saying like, Hey, we have this new artisanal cheese that you guys have all been looking for. And, and, uh, by, by having them, uh, advertise to my group, I earn a percentage of the total fee again, that would be taken by the community. So community to community marketplace where we can cross promote each other. Yeah. It's a social community. So essentially it's very yeah. to like Facebook groups, but the difference is that like, and I keep, I keep making this analogy. It's like what we're really looking to highlight is, you know, Facebook is like a social application and a marketplace combined. And Buns is a market marketplace. And now we're going to have a social application now as well associated on the same app. So when you have two things that are, are comparable, the question becomes, which one do you pick? The one that doesn't pay you or the one that does, that does pay you? And mm-hmm. the hypothesis here is that crypto economics or, or value distribution systems will actually likely have a significant effect on what we understand about network effects. Because when you have two identical, not identical, but you know, nearly at parity platforms, uh, and one compensates you, the economic incentive will likely create new, new forms of network effects as part of our theory. You and I were talking about earlier a little bit about UBI. You know? So we spoke about Libra before the call, we're talking about UBI, and uh, you mentioned as well as uh, we as a user, even though it's an opt-in, we're not forced to use Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. It's an opt-in. We can opt out whenever we want. Yeah. We're not, we're not betting, uh, benefiting from it. But uh, what's, what do you envision? Like, how do you see, like, if yeah. you had that magic wand, how would you envision the future with like a Web3 stack? Sure. Well, I mean, I, mean, I think like, uh, you know, there's a number of amazing infrastructure projects like Polkadot and Ethereum. And just, there's tons of different stuff and stuff that's being worked on. I think the question on the infrastructure side is who's going to achieve scalability. Um, but I think if we imagine, reimagine the future of the internet, it's not just about the infrastructure. It's actually also about who, where, like how the value distribution system of that, that, that kind of uh, uh, ecosystem goes. And I think DAOs are like the first kind of shot at that. Um, but I think the, the answer around UBI is really quite simple. It's like on an annual basis, last year in 2018, $325 billion was spent on digital advertising, of which pretty much zero went to people who use these platforms. And when we look at a platform like Facebook and we say, okay, well, Facebook's worth, worth huge amounts of money. Um, and yet if we removed all the people from the platform, it would be pretty much worthless. So clearly people are creating the accrued value, which means that data is almost like work or data is money. Um, And so then the question becomes is what happens if we took that $325 billion and which is reoccurring, it's not just a one time, one time thing, right? This is like annually that the demand for uh, digital advertising is only growing. And so what happens if we redistributed that to all network participants, that would actually be a sustainable, there's existing demand to do this today to digitally advertise. And all we have to do is create an alternative whereby the value to paid to advertise is distributed to users rather than centralized in a company as profit. And the reason that it's almost impossible for these companies to replicate this, I think, is because they're so deeply entrenched in the capital markets that for them to all of a sudden come out and say, hey, 60% of the $55 billion that we made last year from digital advertising is now going to go to people, their stock mm-hmm. will grow. And so yeah. our, our opportunity, like blockchain represents the fundamental building block, a trustless building block, theoretically, for us to make change, because we no longer have to have, you know, one entity we trust to do this. 
And I think the question then is like, okay, if, if we agree that that it's a great foundation to make change, the question is, what do we what do we want, really want to change? And I think the answer is like, we should have better distribution value distribution systems so that these companies don't become mega monopolies, um, centralizing value, but instead benefit the local economy proportionally to where the software is used. And if we can achieve that, we're literally going to have three impacts. It's going to be environmentally more sustainable. Uh, economically more sustainable, environmentally more sustainable because secondary marketplaces are great for creating better distribution of goods at a local level. So we don't need to ship everything. We have better peer-to-peer -peer relationships because people are transacting more. Um, economically more sustainable because it's getting super expensive to live in cities. And if all of a sudden your passive behaviors on the internet are earning you, you know, if you're an administrator, maybe you're earning comparable to like 2000 bucks a month, that'd be huge. Um, mm -hmm. or, and maybe if you're just a regular, you know, passive person on the application, maybe you're in 50 bucks and you buy like lunch every month or two. Um, and then lastly, um, it's, a, we have the economic benefit, the environmental benefit and the social benefit. I think there's like this, this problem around social applications where like, we actually have no mechanism to actually really, uh, connect with each other at a localized level. So all their social functions are focused on local geography. We, we almost describe it as like a neighborhood network. Um, where, uh, you know, there'll be a building for like, you know, one York street, if you live there, um, or, you know, upper beaches or like Queen and Ossington area. And then there'll also be social interest groups. So like things that we're interested in, like Toronto classic car club or Toronto blockchain group. And like, we're already seeing in the beta, people are creating these kinds of groups. So, but I think what I see in the future is, uh, kind of like a take back with like this new infrastructure being built our opportunity in it is to ensure that we don't migrate the existing problems from the existing infrastructure, like the practices of mm -hmm. some value. We want to create new practices on this new infrastructure that benefit everyone, everyone, because, you know, I think everyone and no one will own the infrastructure. That's the idea. And I always had this idea before where it's like, I think uh, STOs are interesting, but not how people are approaching it. I think we're super early, but I had this idea before where it's like, Okay, let's say you and I were starting a new Facebook as of today. And we don't have to start off in this like crazy decentralized way because we're not there yet. And it's uh, collusion issues with like starting up a team and uh, just scaling issues when you're all decentralized and all the big protocols are, are suffering this issue. Yeah. My thinking was like, okay, um, so you're familiar with like Brave or the trend the idea of like monetizing your data. Yeah. Same thing where you guys are, you know, monetizing uh, my my intellectual knowledge with the surveys that you guys give me and I get my bits. Yeah. But now imagine where it's like, okay, this is cool because that's currency, give or take. Uh, if the currency is pure liquid on exchanges, fluctuates. A dollar today is 22 cents tomorrow and maybe two cents in a week, in a week from now. Who knows? The crypto market fluctuates. Yeah. Um, well, it'd be more interesting where you have two options where it's like, okay, you have your local token. You have then the option within your ecosystem. You can switch the token over to any crypto, Bitcoin, ETH, whatever you want. You know, it's your choice. However, with an STO, when it's done properly, I want to have more skin in the game. I love the platform that I'm using. I want to own a piece of it. So let's say hypothetically through me contributing on this network, I'm earning, I don't know, 500 bucks a month, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna, Adam, you, you don't want bits, you want, there's a, so it's a two token system, right? Yeah. You don't want bits, you want bonds. Yeah, so I, I'll take, but I wanna split it. I want some cash, let's say I take 200 bucks. Yeah. I want 200 bucks, yeah. some cash, but the 300 bucks, give me some stock. Yeah, so this is something we talk about a lot. Um, and we actually have quite a number of plans to do something to this effect. Um, so really what you want is you want, you do want a two token system. You want a, a system whereby, whereby you have a stable unit of value that can be, uh, transparently earned, not just bought, but earned, uh, mm -hmm. the network for participation, data and attention, because it has a very real market that we identified earlier, which is that $325 billion annual reoccurring revenue market. <clears throat> then you want a token that represents the total network value or the, or, or, the, and that's almost like a stock or a security mm -hmm. token that represents not just the stable version, but like if all of a sudden tomorrow, 15 million more users start using Buns app, um, that, that token, because of the number of new, uh, more people, the 15 million people add attention and earning capacity to the network, which we can fulfill with advertising, increases the value of that security token. Um, mm -hmm. so very much like, and yes, and you could, 
you could essentially take your bits and buy buns. So we, we, we often talk about it in terms of bits tokens and buns tokens. Uh, buns tokens have not been something we've openly discussed, but it, but it is something that yeah, we're working It's on. early. The infrastructure, I would say the infrastructure is not there yet. And it's also like a psychological game too. Is like I think people need some time to wrap their head around the fact that, A, they're earning, uh, let's say, uh, you can call it points, bits, whatever. They're earning value in a system. Yep. And they can move that value from point A to point B. It's up to them how they decide to move value. At the exact same time, now they have it's it's not on the publicly traded TSX. It's, it might be something different, like a Reg D, Reg A, some own STO uh, offering, uh, where they can actually own ownership inside of this. Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's going to be a long curve before people kind of get uses in the type of system. Yeah, I think like if we go back, it's like I to I agree with everything you're saying about this, and like this is something that's very much an ongoing conversation internally here. Um, I think really, if you look at it, what you're looking to do is essentially this: you're looking to create an alternative to traditional advertising model models and networks. And mm -hmm. what you want to do is instead of centralizing the value, you want to distribute the value the best you can, while making sure that the business or the operation of the company currently is still sustainable. Um, and then what you want to do even further than that is not just distribute the ongoing value, but is distribute the equity value of the company to its participants. So everyone has not just an income, but a form of ownership of the total network. Um, and so really like the way we look at it is, you know, there's a lot of platforms out there that are social community oriented and none of them compensate people. So really like the, the differentiator, the, the, the moat between Facebook and Buns is uh, distributing value derived from data, attention, and contribution to the network. Um, because because it's simply something that Facebook simply can't copy. Uh, because if they did, theoretically, it would cause massive issues. Um, and like, wouldn't it be something? It be something amazing. And I mean, maybe maybe Buns is it. Maybe Buns won't be it. I don't know. But wouldn't it be amazing if we saw this suite of software be held as the uh, alternative to traditional software as we understand it today, whereby everyone owns it um, and everyone benefits from it uh, just for their current behaviors today. Like that, that's, I think, the key here, because then all of a sudden you have a sustainable form of income um, that's based on passive behaviors. Yeah, it's an opt-in co-op as opposed to a forced one. Yeah, we talk about it as an internet co-op. Um, yeah. That's really what it is. Yeah, I think once, uh, you know, we do have like certain legal frameworks in Canada, like the Jobs Act, but it's complicated in the States. They have Reg A and Reg D. Um, I don't think so tech-wise we're quite there yet. But I think I think the writing's on the wall, and I think the ingredients are in the recipe. If you look at what's happening with the lack of trust in Facebook, you look at them, um, I don't know if you're following, following, but the issues with free speech, you know, they're targeting people. Either you have a – either you have – a blanket law that applies to all, or you don't have it at all. Yeah, I, um, and I so mm -hmm. yeah, no, I agree. Right, go on. Sorry, I don't interrupt you. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Um, and so for me, I think, I think the narrative is hyper accelerating, where people are just fed up with Facebook, Twitter, etc. We need a you know, better solution. It's, and like the problem is this, though. I think like the problem is that like we look at Facebook and we a lot of, it's really easy to bash Facebook, but really like it was this important mission critical stepping stone in how we got here. Uh, yeah. Like it's so like amazing, amazing things were achieved through what they did. But like the missed opportunity was to, like these companies promote, like we're going to change the world. It's going to be a better place. It's, you know, we're all about environmental sustainability. We're all about community. We're all about connecting. Whenever I hear that, that's like negative social signaling to me. It it's is. like, yeah. why do you, why do you have to tell me this? Yeah. And so I think like, I think whenever, whenever I, you know, I totally agree with you, it is, but it's I, like, yeah, 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 we're, we're all, it's like, I'm a socially conscious entrepreneur. I'm like, okay. Like yeah. it, by default, you should just be a good entrepreneur. I don't get it. Like, uh, why do you have to label yourself? Like, like uh, Google, I think they removed it. Like don't do evil. It's like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the blockchain space's response was can't do evil. Right. Can't do evil, uh, yeah. So I think like, but I think the, there's a temptation to just be like, this is all crap and like they suck and this and that. But like they brought a ton of good to the world. But I think now we're at a state where we look back on it a bit with like retrospect. You can look back. It has enough history to look back now and be like, hey, maybe like it's, it gets that what if feeling. Like what if we did this a bit differently whereby 
we really actually paid the people the value rather than the network earning the value while still making it a sustainable operation, like, wouldn't that be something different? Different. And I think like people are beginning to look for alternatives because uh, there's something fundamentally unagreeable about that amount of centralization of value when we know that without people, that value would not accrue. So like, yeah. th- that that's the, the the kind of the that that's I think where the root of a lot of where this is coming from. And I think it's not just also it's not just like you know there's a, a huge amount of mistrust in Facebook. Then blockchain came around, and there's a ton of hype in crypto, and people were talking about UBI. Like it's not a coincidence that all these ideas are being discussed in parallel. Um, I think really what's happening is like we're looking to as we move from one infrastructure stack, call it Web 2, to a new infrastructure stack, call it Web 3, we have an opportunity. The change is opportune. We have an opportunity in that change to make more changes. And I think the question is, we need to know what we want to change about it. And to me, the obvious thing is, like, wouldn't it be amazing if people, we can make people's lives more affordable, affordable, we could create a more sustainable environmental future, and we could connect people meaningfully locally. Like those three things are worth doing because they're having hugely negative impacts on the world today. Yeah, that's a major trend I've been noticing too. I think, you know, globalization had its benefits for global economies, but at the exact same time, we've negated localization. Yeah. Like specifically with tariff rules and certain tax, like it's cheaper for us in Canada from a taxation and uh, trade agreements that we have to import apples than it is for us to buy apples in Niagara Falls, which yeah. is pretty fucked up. Yeah. It's like Niagara Falls is 70 kilometers. How the fuck's it more expensive? Yeah. So this is something that comes up quite a bit. Like one of the things that we're doing with the reason we built a, a POS app, like a, like a merchant app for our, our businesses is we wanted to give them the ability to bring their inventory online. Because mm. like, something very special happens in the internet when new inventory comes online. And I, a good example is Uber or Airbnb. Um, like when that inventory, inventory comes online and it wasn't previously on the internet, like it has a very you know, interesting effect because it can create, again, it creates an alternative to what we understand as the marketplaces today. Um, and so when we launch the merchant app, we actually give the merchants the ability to uh, bring items online. So essentially the way we think about it is like, imagine, you know, six months from now when all of a sudden, uh, you know, you have all the stuff that is typically available uh, through, you know, all these centralized platforms that ship things in like Amazon or whatever else. Um, And instead you can get it locally. You'll actually be able to get it cheaper and faster theoretically um, through this network because you have new inventory available in an aggregated marketplace at a local level. Um, and that, that could actually, at, you know, with the right, enough density and population, enough density and usage, you actually could create uh, a competitor to Amazon from that. Um, so these are like some really crazy ideas, but by essentially by bringing new inventory online, um, essentially you're, you're going to reduce again, the environmental impact of shipping, but you're going to have things, uh, readily available faster and cheaper, especially with 3d printing. Yeah. So. Like my last business was in China, it was in clothing, believe it or not. We had specialized underwear and, uh, you know, supply chain nightmares, right? Yeah. Guangzhou to Canada. We actually, our business was crazy. We shipped from China, made in Canada, stamp made in Canada, shipped back to Hong Kong. We sold it to the Asian markets. Wow. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, if you look at a lot of stuff, like you look at Alibaba, AliExpress, except for a select few items, majority of that is all oil-based products. Yeah. Right. You look at stuff on Amazon, eBay, you know, sunglasses, plastic jewelry, yeah. cups, like regular stuff that people buy, right? Yep. Yeah. A lot of that stuff can be fucking 3D printed right here. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, I think like we're, we're still at this inflection point where we have an opportunity to really change the way we look at things. Um, I think there's- It just, it just have to be, it has to be profitable. That's the only difference. You know what I mean? Like once, yeah. once a tech is, it is- uh, matured enough and the scales of economics make sense, then it's going to become ubiquitous. Yeah. I, I also think though that like by refocusing, like when money goes into one of these large, like kind of monopoly monopolies, be it a marketplace or a managed marketplace or a social network, you're really, what you're doing is you're extracting value from a geography. Um, because mm-hmm. money that wouldn't, would, you know, would otherwise have been spent within a local economy and now it's being centralized into like an Irish bank account by a San Francisco company that domiciles there. Um, so 
I think the, the opportunity is also to create simply more resilient economies by having a higher velocity of transactions happening locally with local business owners and entrepreneurs that yeah. then uh, focusing on, and the key is that they have to be cheaper and easier than the existing competitors. Uh, yeah. And that's what software does, right? So I think, so, I think somewhere in between learning from Web2 and using those strategic advantages in our favor while adopting these mentalities of Web3 where like, we don't need a company, we don't need another company that makes $200 billion a year. We don't need that. What we need is to recirculate $150 billion of the $200 billion to people in Canada or to people in America or to people wherever in the world and have those that, that proportional usage uh, create more affordable lives for everybody. That's what I think. Yeah, the thing is like, you look at taxation, you look at for them going to Ireland, you know, 1% or has majority of them like Amazon, Walmart, they do IP like leasing deals between different jurisdictions, right? So they have no, uh, uh, what's it called? No, uh, no profit. Yeah. Um, the human psychology, um, no matter what, from a game theoretical model, people will go where they can save money. That's it. Right. So the more you squeeze, squeeze people, the more intellectual capital disappears. It's simple as that. And so I think one thing, and, and this is why I'm big locally, and this is why I've been screaming here for in Canada for a long time. Other places exist. Singapore is one example. No place is perfect, but I'll use Singapore as an example. Um, I think in Canada, we have a golden opportunity since we have such a diverse uh, background of different people, different ethnicities, different cultures very small population, fucking huge landmass. Uh, we have, Canada has one of the biggest issues of great startups starting here and disappearing because the opportunity is not here. Yeah. Um, we need to start creating economic zones. If you want to incentivize company and like big companies is easy for them. They have the profits like, you know, like, fuck, if I wanted to do what they do, it's going to probably cost me like a million dollars a year just to run the, the financials and the legal team to have that afloat. Yeah. And uh, they need, we need to have economic zones here where it's like, Hey, listen, and they've done this in some areas in New York. David Rose, uh, one of the original angel investors in the uh, United States, wrote the book. Was, was, he, was he the Dig It guy or Dig? Was he the Dig guy? I, I think so. Like he's he's been doing angel investing since day one. I think Dust was – I forget his book's name. Um, and so it's like, okay, I'm a small business. Yeah, taxes are so-so, but what if – there's economic zones where we have subsidized rent because rent's a huge fucking issue when it comes to like startups. Like that's probably like 25% of your overhead cost just for rent alone. Yeah. But we have subsidized area economic zones where it's up to five years, tax-free, whatever you make, doesn't matter. But there's, there's criteria is higher locally. Uh, you know, they, they will make, we'll make, we'll make proper uh, criteria, but the incentive, it's all about incentive. Like, uh, you know, um, Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger has a great saying, show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. Why would a big multi-corporate uh, national company that has billions of dollars in public trade share, why would they take a 25% cut? They wouldn't. The incentive incentive's not there, as simple as that. You can scream and shout all you want. You think you go after them, good luck with that. It's not, there's no incentive for them to give the government 25% of their, you know, whatever they made, $100 billion. Yeah. Uh, but what, what happens if we do make incentives where it actually makes sense for the company to make even more money in the future? Yeah, I mean, like, I think this is interesting because, like, what we're essentially, I think those economic incentives need to exist at an individual level and at an organizational level. Mm -hmm. And so, like, at an individual level, I, I think you're, you're echoing what I was saying earlier around when you have two platforms that are, you know, feature ubiquitous, meaning they're identical almost in capability for both social, social, market, social application and marketplace, which one will you choose, the one that pays you or the one that doesn't? Well, this goes back to nature. Like you look at something called Gall's law, yeah. where there's no complex organism ever evolved from another complex organism. Everything came from a singular cellular organism and sl slowly evolved over time. Yeah. If you look at like the human body from the mitochondria within our human cells and going all the way up into, let's say, uh, red blood cells and then the muscle tissues and into skeletal tissue, et cetera, eat from, from the very small microscopic level within the mitochondria all the way up to my muscle tissue, they work on a hierarchical level. Everything's connected. Everybody actually has skin in the game. One thing fails, everything fails. So imagine like, uh, that's the problem. Like people don't have skin in the game. So they scream and shout. It's like, Oh, fuck that guy. Fuck this guy. I'm like, but you have nothing to lose. So you're screaming all day. No shit. Right. Yeah. If you have something to lose, you won't be screaming. <laughs> You'll be protecting yeah. what you have to lose. So imagine like if you have like, I don't know, um, 
I don't know, like a million Canadians that have like buns, STO, like a stock of buns, right? And then they come to realization, oh, fuck, we're getting fucked for taxes. You know, you have a million Canadians getting fucked for taxes. They have skin in the game. They're losing. Yeah. Uh, I'll bet you money those million Canadians will speak up. Be like, yo, government, do fucking fix something. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, like, so we actually have this conversation quite a lot. And like it, and like it kind of, again, it's resembled the co-op ownership. It resembles the STO um, and, and I think it has implications for sure. Um, but I, I think like there, there's, there's two, there's always two pieces to this. Like, well, I think most importantly, the most important thing I think to take from this conversation is that like, we need an alternative, um, mm-hmm. because we don't have one. You can like right now that we don't have a good alternative to create a, a new narrative whereby the people that use a network benefit, um, and be you know, possibly there's the ability for them to be able to convert their bits to buns tokens. And also if you don't have bits to be able to buy buns tokens with some sort of crowd sale, um, like even that kind of model we've discussed. Um, and I think it's important because what it does is it, it, it gives people, again, it gives what, what you're saying, it gives people skin. It gives them a reason to have um, excitement that, that the network will, work will continue to grow. And we've actually seen this be a highly successful Um, kind of model for growth and for profitability of company Um, because now people are cheering for it because they feel that they Mm -hmm. can economically benefit with a multiple, not just the stable coin um, if it succeeds as a platform. Um, It's a mythology, right? It's a narrative. It's a psychological trigger where I am not a user. I'm the owner. Yeah. And like, this is one of the things I, I actually try really hard to like do is make sure we call them people. Like, because like, they're just like you and I, everyone who uses this, like, and like, you know, I think like over 20% of Toronto now uses funds. Um, wow. and, and like, so I think like when we look at it, we really want to do something that, um, and it's, it's not entirely like, you know, um, altruistic, like, it, you know, 40% of the money right now goes to the operational side of our business and 60% goes to the community. So the lion's share is going to the community, but, you know, we have a long way to, long way to go to getting to the point where even more goes to the network. But obviously right now we're at the early stages and we've got to do quite a lot to build and get that infrastructure stood up to where we're satisfied that it can scale and others, others can take it over. Um, but I think that the, the idea there is definitely that, uh, that, that, and like, you know, in early meetings, I always said things like, I would love for this to end up where uh, everyone and no one owns it. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, that it, it has a positive impact on local economies, uh, wherever it's used. Um, and I think that narrative is becoming more and more likely as we close the gap between like what Facebook is today and what Buns is. And as we kind of release our social functions, you're not going to be able to run social groups on Buns. You can run them on Facebook. You can post stuff for sale on Facebook or you can post stuff on buns and this one pays you and this one doesn't. And like, as that narrative begins to, to, to favor uh, the, you know, the economics begin to favor the individual dual rather than favor the profit of the company. Um, that in itself is going to be the most important thing that we can achieve. At, at my belief is this is the most important thing we can achieve out of this technology. And like, I continually caution people do not migrate existing systems like for like on chain. It's irresponsible because we know they're not sustainable. Yeah. Um, and so we need to make changes and we need an alter- alter- alternative narrative. And that alternative narrative is that people matter more than profit. Um, and that, that, that will be a great business model in and of itself um, because you're, you're, you're putting the economics of the, the person first and aligning the company's incentives to the person's incentives beautifully said uh if people want to find out more information about buns get involved help you guys out what's the best resource uh you can download the buns app uh it's for ios and android or you can go to bunz.com or bunz if you're canadian right which one's the canadian american version B-U- where the z where the z is it yeah where the z? yeah i'm pretty yeah yeah so bunz for the american folks uh bunz for the canadian folks um uh, you can download in the ios or android app store uh, if you activate your wallet, uh, you can enter the handle Z E R O C O O L zero cool. Uh, that's my username and you'll get a referral bonus. Uh, but yeah, use it, post some stuff that you're not using anymore. Transact with other people locally, tell your friends and like, let's change things piece by piece. And I mean, day by day. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And talk to you soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for the time.